Hello and welcome to this video on an interesting example of inherited genetic defects, disorders and disease. We have previously made videos on inheritance, some were on diversity, and others on bottlenecks of populations. These mostly focused on an outside force, such as nature, but what happens when people choose to be insular? The Ashkenazi Jewish people are a perfect example of just this situation. Overall, the Ashkenazi Jewish genetic disease groups are a cluster of otherwise rare disorders that occur more often than not in a particular cluster of people. These are people of Eastern European descent, hence the name Ashkenazi, but they're also culturally and religiously Jewish people. This means we can narrowly define the population that is most affected by them. The reason the Ashkenazi Jews themselves are particularly noteworthy is that, for the most part, these diseases are often very severe and can cause premature death. Through modern medicine and other developments, the symptoms have been significantly reduced and people can live a full life. Historically, though, that was not the case. This meant that they came to prominence in the mindset of researchers because of this particular phenomena. They have become well known as an example because there are only approximately 10 million Ashkenazi Jews in the world. This means it is very common among a very well defined population that can trace their ancestry back to only 350 people from about 600 to 800 years ago. It is often argued that race and ethnicity have no correlation with people's health outcomes. We have heard some academics claim that race does not influence any health outcome full stop. This is both true and false. While yes, environment and upbringing is a significant factor for many diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disease and more, it needs somewhere to start from. On the other hand, some diseases require no stimulus and silently wait for the right time to strike. This entire situation has been somewhat controversial as a position and became more so in the 20th century. One persistent focus of research was on the Ashkenazi Jewish people and their predisposition to several different diseases. Once we began looking into genetics, it was clearly established that they were autosomal recessive disorders. The best study of these was Tay-Sachs disease. They became studied and associated with the Ashkenazi Jewish people because they were more prevalent among those particular people than any other. It's also been shown that they bear some of their own unique genetic mutations that apply to the Ashkenazi Jewish people, but not to other examples of these diseases. We make a point of how common it is amongst one particular population because as many as one in four, and according to some studies, as many as one in three people of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage carry the various mutations for one or more of these diseases. That means one in four or one in three of the approximately 10 million people. Although there are a range of diseases, the most commonly recognized and associated with the Ashkenazi Jewish population are Gaucher disease, cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs disease, familial dysautonomia, and Canavan disease. We've previously spoken about various ways a population can become quite concentrated, koala bears being a good example. In this case, it's something known as the founder effect. 600 to 800 years ago, something occurred to drastically reduce the number of people who were in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. This was a 350 approximate population that gave rise to the rest of the people we know today. And this phenomena is known as the founder effect. It drastically and suddenly reduced the genetic diversity of their population. Because there was so little diversity, and new genes weren't being readily introduced 
through marriages to outside people, there was a massive increase in the risk of developing various genetic disorders and diseases. That's because they would only ever inherit the adverse or recessive alleles and quite often from both parents. This has been compounded over time by the relative common practice of insular marriages within their own ethnic and cultural group. These are known as co-sanguineous marriages. You might also know this as an Alabama marriage. In order for the offspring to develop any one of the various genetic disorders associated with being an Ashkenazi Jewish person, they need to inherit two copies of the gene associated with that disease. That means either both parents must be carriers, or at least one of them is a carrier and one of them has the disease. This is one of the big problems. When we mention the cosanguineous marriages, the chances are significantly greater that at least one if not both parents will carry these genes. This has led to modern technology and genetic research being used in an attempt to understand just what is happening. Researchers looking into this have found that the variety and nature of diseases and why they occur so more commonly in Ashkenazi Jewish people is simply down to this very narrowly defined genetic variation, and this gives rise to a number of diseases. The first of these we want to talk about is Crohn's disease. They found that there are 10 mutations, and possibly more in other studies, that increase the risk for Crohn's disease. This increases the risk of them developing it, and the severity of it once it does occur. That's just one disease, and the number and nature of the genes that the children inherit from their parents will either increase their predisposition or slightly decrease it, but it always remains above the average for the whole population of the world. This means that they are always going to have a significantly higher relative risk. Then you have things like Bloom syndrome. This is where children will be born, but their growth will be stunted for life. It will also cause their skin to become very red. Weirdly enough, it's also associated with an increase in lung and ear infections. Canavan disease is another one, and it is perhaps one of the more unpleasant options that could occur. It's a disease that slowly but surely destroys the brain. Next is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a disease where thick mucus develops in the lungs, along with other mucous membranes, preventing breathing, digestion, and gradually these things become more and more difficult, eventually impossible, leading to death. Choking to death on your own mucus isn't exactly very high on our list of ways to go. Familial dysautonomia is an interesting scenario, though. This is one in which someone cannot feel pain. More accurately, the sensory input from the periphery does not go back to their brain properly. This means that although they don't sense pain, their body attempts to sweat a lot. They also have trouble with speech and coordination. Gaucher disease is another instance, and it causes problems with their liver, spleen, and bone marrow. You can imagine that when you have problems with these particular areas of the body, you would have other issues, such as Fanconi anemia. This is one where the red blood cells aren't produced properly. It also increases the risk of cancer quite significantly. Then we have mucolipidosis. This is a case where the nervous system begins to deteriorate and break down over time. Much like other diseases, this causes more and more problems. Then you have Nyman Pick disease. This causes fat to build up in the liver, spleen, lymph nodes, and bone marrow. 
as you will note so far, several of the other diseases also cause this. And you can see why with so many closely related diseases and pathologies, why people would begin to think that perhaps there was more to it than just bad luck. Next is Tay-Sachs disease. This causes fat globules to build up on the inside of the brain and nervous system. Much like other diseases we've mentioned so far, this has an impact on both the brain's ability to function, but also creates very obvious symptoms with motor functions and sensory functions, let alone cognitive function. Finally, there's torsion dystonia. This is where people have spasms. Spasms in a very particular way. It causes the muscles to twist, primarily in their arms, legs, and sometimes their body itself. As we've mentioned in the past, eugenics is not something that's gone away entirely. In fact, there are some of the most comprehensive and well-established genetic testing programs that are intended to identify the heterozygous carriers of those genes that cause things like Tay-Sachs. These programs began in the 70s and have continued ever since. The idea behind this is to be able to identify those who carry those genes and give them genetic counseling on what options they have available when it comes to reproduction. You certainly want to avoid having children where you both have the possibility of passing on a gene to them that could, if not destroy their life immediately, cause them long-term harm and then ultimately their death. Many of these programs almost exclusively focus on the Ashkenazi Jewish people. This is for one simple reason. They can take one standardized test which has a battery of the most common genetic disorders that are associated with that particular group and be able to produce a result reliably and effectively. Trying to do the same thing with other groups would be far less effective because the cluster of diseases isn't as clearly associated. The somewhat unexpected irony is that the Ashkenazi Jewish population have, for the most part, accepted and embraced these particular tests to try and avoid causing harm to their community and children. This has had a very desirable effect in that it reduced the frequency of the disorders by a huge margin. This is a perfect example of what happens with the founder effect and consanguineous relationships over a long term. We're talking 600 to 800 years. There have been other shorter term and more intensive examples such as in ancient Egypt, but none have been as well established because there has not been the access and none have been contemporary until now. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions that you have below.